Okay. Is there any, Sophia, could you? I think the problem is you're not muted and she was. Um, Yes, I can hear you, but there is uh, quite an echo. If anybody is logged into the meeting, I'll be on my phone to turn off your audio. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, it was me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm also not able to uh, start my video. It says um, the host has stopped my video. So. <laughs> I'm happy to be a uh, man behind the curtain, too, if that gets the meeting started. So. Um. So before we before we dive into the discussion about the proposed rules, I've asked or Lucas asked Nancy to give us a brief overview reminder uh, about sort of the difference between input and discussion and, and official comment and just the, the APA right. process. So um, the public meeting was yesterday, um, and um, another way to put in official formal public comment is by sending it in writing through the portal that's on the website. Um, a discussion today by individual board members is not considered a public comment under the Administrative Procedures Act or what rulemaking is because oral comments are not. Having said that, because the board does indeed have a role, although it's an advisory role, the board has a role in input and rulemaking. So if the, I'm sorry, I keep calling you the board, the authority, same thing to me. Um, so if, the, if there were a certain um, item that the authority wanted to take a vote on, it could take a vote on that and the, um, and the department would consider that vote from the authority to be part, to be a comment, a formal comment. But otherwise, anything that you say verbally today um, you might want to sort of flesh out something that you're sending in writing, um, and that's fine, but it, it's not substituting for sending in a comment in writing. 
natural born numbers, but it's not. So the written input that we received and was circulated are not, uh, they could become public comment if those individuals wanted to go on the portal and submit them, but they're not by virtue of sharing them with this group. Is that correct? correct? Thank you for the clarification. That is correct. <clears throat> and will the board be able, should the board be considering making motions about things we come to agreement on that we would like to make as a public comment? So I, I don't want to say should, but may, could. could. Good. Yeah, you may. So the board may consider doing that as you're hearing the public comments and the ones that were. Yeah. And if we did vote, um, would we then need to follow up with the with the written comment, or would the vote? I, it is my legal opinion that that vote would count because of the authority of the authority of the authority to give input to give input at a formal meeting. I think. Uh, Via vote is sufficient. That's not can, can you give us a summary of the comments from from uh, yesterday? Uh, so what was discussed and what was is that permitted? Well, um, so nor we can't give you a summary of the comments today. We respond to all those comments at the end of the rulemaking process. Having said that, um, if anyone was in the room yesterday um, and heard those comments, they're certainly free to share that with the board. I was there. I took notes. I don't think I have that notepad with me, but I can tell you, I mean, um, a lot of what came up over and over again was the, the, the substitution, the, the plan substitution and the you know, uh, taxation for the 15 to 18 month period. So that came up a fair amount. Undue hardship came up a fair amount. Um, there were some um, some references to affinity relationships. Um, we can let you help me out here. Um, no, I think that captures the themes. It is also online now, the recording from yesterday. Um, I would add, I think 12 people spoke in total, close to the final count. The room was quite packed, but the, the hearing was under an hour, under an hour. Which, was, which was surprising to me. I thought it was going to be longer. Yeah. So, and you know, I think of, among, you know, in terms of the private plan substitution, I also heard some large, um, larger employers expressing that they already pay for and have, um, you know, paid family medical leave, let's say. And, and so that was one of the, one of the, Questions that they had, and they went, we're already doing it, and we're planning to do it privately. Having to pay into the public auction just doesn't seem to make sense for us and our large number of employees. So, is it available now for folks to, to so. listen to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the, you know the list of the topics that are on the agenda, um, which we can we can go through in this order, were from our last meeting, which was before the proposed rules were um, before we had the proposed rules. I think we were identifying subject matters that um, that we thought you know were were of interest to this group, but I recognize that might shift based on new rules. Just yeah. had a general question, if that's all right. I don't have a good sense of what weight the public comments have. We've heard a lot about what ours count as and don't count as, but what do the public count comments count as? The, um, the department considers input from the public whenever it does any sort of rule. Um, it considers whether there are things that were overlooked um, or not thought about in depth. It, you know, it, it's something that's considered it's something that they have to consider i think it's hard to put weight on it and basically it depends upon the individual comment there's no weight given to public comments that are contrary to the statute i might add and whenever there's rulemaking there's public comments that are contrary to statute okay I'm going to just take through the agenda, the topics on the agenda, uh, see if there's um, interest in discussion. So determining the employer size, is that something that anyone wants to? Yeah. Yes. 
Um, so I did read uh, in the proposed rulemaking the paragraph about employer size and whether it's 15 and I don't know if 15 is inclusive in the above or the below. I think it's above. Um, and and it said it included temporary, seasonal, part-time, full-time uh, workers. And so I think there was discussion last month as to whether or not that would be a formula related to FTEs or anything like that. And so I, I just want to be clear what I what I read and interpreted was that I have an employee who um, maybe works five hours a month and they're an employee as of October 1st, 2024, and they count in my 15. Yeah, right? We, I mean, no matter what kind of employee or how many hours they work or how long they've worked for you or anything like that. Is, am I... <laughs> Yeah, the way it's written in the proposal is head count as of October 1st. Mm -hmm. um, so just a straight head count, no look back period um, as of that date is okay. what they proposed. Oh, yeah, that's how I read it. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure um, yep. that's how I was understanding it correctly. I think I can see employers who are in the, you know, they have, they have lots of part time employees um, or seasonal employees who are still working as of October 1st. I can see them employers bulking at that a little bit or maybe even making decisions like I'm gonna fire everybody <laughs> before October 1st, you know, as opposed to keeping them mm -hmm. through, you know, the end of October on a seasonal basis or something like that. And they'll just have to, you know, thinking to themselves, I'll just deal with it for a couple. Cause that then is reflective of their entire period of um taxation for the upcoming year, right? So I just Something to consider. And that's every year, Mark. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. October of every year sets the, the premium exemption for small businesses for the, the following year. So, so that does mean many seasonal workers will be done by October 1st. Right. Maybe. I, I think that's early. I'm sure there's some, some that will be still on, but a lot. But a number won't. That's, that's what I was thinking. But then I was curious no. about. Like, I think the season is, uh -huh. so the season vast majority will be end of October. Yes. Yeah. End of October. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure if you place like post October 1st. Yeah. At least definitely for Indigenous People's Day. I mean, um, mm, yeah, that's, that's a huge, huge, yeah. That's a huge weekend. It's a huge weekend. Hospitality wise. Yeah. I think upon that, not just potentially firing people, but maybe some earlier closures. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether I'm that's consequences to think about. Right I mean, whether that's reasonable or not, I mean, it may be a, a thing people think of. Right. right. You know. Isn't there a lot of harvesting that goes on in October through apple picking time? Mm -hmm. Berries. Yes. So the, the seasons do depend on that. But if you have a crop to get in, you can't employ that season. Mm -hmm. So there's that issue with somebody there. And if you are in a labor that is through a uh, program that is contracted to a certain amount of time, usually. So, you know, it. however, as an employer, you may feel that you were the one was primarily the date was chosen so that they could count you and you could contribute to a program that your employees are not going to be able to avail themselves of. There's a possibility with that. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to, it, it sounds like the, the season depends, depends on the year, depends on. I, I think a lot, I are. mean, I, I, I'm more than happy to reach out to, um, I think mostly affected would be ecological um, season for those um, affected mostly um, after the, you know, with regards to October 1st and see what their situation of when their roles change full time for employees. Yes. I brought this up last time, and I don't know if there's clarification on this yet. When when it's set at fifteen, is that per EIN per taxpayer, or say I've got a dealership group, four different businesses, I've got an aggregate of a hundred employees. One dealership only has eight. Are they exempt if the owners of all of all of the businesses are the same, the same ownership structure? 
well, then how do I explain to three quarters of my businesses that you guys have to pay, but this other business you don't have to pay? I think the intent was by EIN. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes the IRS looks at it differently. Okay. When it comes to programs with similar ownership structures. <clears throat> yes. Can we ask Nancy? Um, do you believe that the statute in in the definition of employer already defines what would constitute an employee for that purpose? Um, I believe the statute needs some clarification. Um, there are other laws that, and we, I mean, one, one of the thinking was that a static date was easier mm -hmm. than saying your average over the last Sure, that, that's for number of employees, but in terms of the actual definition of employee no, in, rela de in relation to his it question. Doesn't, it doesn't say how you, whether you calculate it for the last 12 months or whether you calculate it on a static date. So we came up with a static date. Right, now my question, uh, Sam had just mentioned, would, would the, the employer be the person, the EIN, the other, in statute it says person, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporate, I mean, it defines each individual entity makeup that's considered an employer right right and that's always i mean in wage and hour law for instance mm -hmm. in the gray area and i really don't want to go down okay. this rabbit hole but there's like joint employment and, <laughs> um so for purposes of this doing it by 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 ein is the intent and that's considered that be right it's might need to be clarified. It might need yeah. to be clarified. Yeah. It's a good slide. Yeah. Can an employer with less than 15 opt in? Or does that not well, qualify? Well, they're in the program. They're not paying the premiums. Well, what I'm saying is, yeah. can they pay the full premium? For their employees? Yeah, I think that's covered in the rule now. But okay. that, that discretion to pay the 0.5 is already there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to just come back to something you said, Sam. How do I explain to these people that these these folks have to pay and these ones don't? For less than 15, it's the employer share that is waived. So if the employees are paying, all the employees are paying. Okay. Yeah. Really, uh, yes. Can I say really quick? And so in that vein, and the employer can elect to pay the employee's portion if they choose to. Correct. Yes. And they can also elect to pay a portion of the employees, like maybe not all 0.5, maybe 0.25 and they share it for, you know, like, so an employer can make that election. Correct. Okay. It's the only stipulation in the rule now that was proposed is that if they're electing to do a portion of the employee share, it has to be the same for all employees. Um, mm -hmm. That is in rule, but they can do 0.2 percent. Yes. Any further discussion on employer size? I think the way I'd like to do this is to go through the topics and discuss, and then we can circle back and decide if we want to vote on anything. I don't think we have anything to be able to do that. So, moving on to uh, definition of family and affinity relationship. Is there another copy of the agenda? Okay, so I start. I will. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 
so we're on page seven, right? That would be the enemy relationship. Is that what you just mentioned? So I guess what I what I would say is that affinity relationship and um, family member seems to be used in the rules. I don't know if it's meant to be interchangeable, but it, it, it's not. You're saying no, it's not. But it, um, affinity relationship is referenced on page seven. It's also referenced, it's defined on the first page. Defined on the first page. Um, but family member is not defined. So affinity relationship is in the definition. Mm -hmm. Family member is not to your point, Maria, I think. Right. And and the statute family member is defined right. as including yeah, an affinity or a, a relationship. Um, I guess the, the definition of family member includes someone designated by the covered individual in accordance with the rule. Um, an individual with whom the covered individual has a significant personal bond that is or is like a family relationship, regardless of biological or legal relationship. And so the rules reference family member in some places, affinity relationship in, in another. And on page one, if it does track the statute that is or is like a family relationship, I think it's a little bit confusing because does it include? Family relationships, and then if if the rules narrow coverage for those with affinity relationships, does that somehow mean that include family relationships? That's one question. It yeah. seems a little bit confusing. We are kind of using a separate concept because there's the, the requirement that you can only designate one affinity relationship per year. That wouldn't apply to a family member in general. Um, and the is or is like family. So it could be like a cousin, for instance, that's not covered in the broader definition of family. So it could be a family member who is not one of the family members otherwise specified. So like a cousin like um, and aunt. Um, you know, it could be an affinity relationship or it might not be somebody just family. It could be your best friend. It could be your elderly neighbor you're taking care of. So that's why I think it's is or is not. Uh, but we're trying to use affinity relationships separately because there is that special qualification that you can only have one designated person per year. Whereas family, you might be able to take six weeks for your father or six weeks for your mother. Um, we're, we're precluding one affinity designation per year. So we're trying to use it as a subset of family, but it, it's a specific term. That's helpful to understand. So, and the limiting to one um, to one person per year is that is that in the statute? It's not in the statute. Obviously, a family relationship has gotten a lot of attention. So, I mean, I, I think they're just trying to balance, you know, all the larger concerns about, you know, how that's going to be used. Um, so that was just something that was put in there that if you're saying this person is important, you're basically certifying this is the, the one person I'm going to use an affinity relationship for all year. And, and it is that is a practice in other states as well. Too. And I can also add the term affinity relationship is not in the statute. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if anyone's doing a global search in the statute. Um, so affinity relationship is under 19G, which is covered in significant personal bond. And affinity relationship is a term of art that other states have used. Another thing that's helpful for me with affinity relationships mm -hmm. is it, it gets a lot of attention, obviously, and people bring it up a lot. But like when we look to other states, like what percentage of your claims actually are affinity claims? Um, and Connecticut is probably the, the best analog. I think Oregon has it as well. Uh, but Connecticut has a very similar definition that's you know broad for ours. 12% of their total claims are for taking care of a family member, 12% of 100% of claims. And of that 12% of family claims, 1.8% 1 .8 are penny claims. So we're talking well under 1% of total claims are actually penny claims. Um, so it's one of those things that you know is put into law as important for the people that need them. You know, especially LGBTQ communities that may not have traditional family structures. It's yeah. important, absolutely important for those people that need them. And also, it's not something that's used very often, but it does have, you know, I think by virtue of what it is, oversized attention for the actual claim amount that have come up in other states. So I was thinking about uh, pregnancy, postpartum, and uh, taking care of a child who might be ill. So with pregnancy, I presume both parents would qualify either uh, together or sequentially. Um, and does that apply also to, again, same sex 
couples? Does it apply to uh, where one may not have a biologic uh, relationship with the, with the child, the newborn, but a family relationship, or does it require a formal adoption on the part of that person? Uh, and as a child gets older, say you've got a two-year-old now who's seriously ill, there's a, a mother. What about the, the other person in the relationship? What if they're uh, no longer in that relationship? Does that other person have an affinity claim um, if they participate or say they're no longer in the relationship and one parent has sole custody? Does that other person have a potential for an affinity claim? Uh, just ask. Yeah, I mean, I think the child definition is pretty broad too, but I, I think that would also cover under affinity if that person is important to you, yeah. But you can't have more than one person making it. And, and who decides? Well, uh, since the child can't decide who they're the, affinity the, person. The claimant can only take leave from one affinity person. There's nothing precluding two people from taking a claim on the same person and rules that proposed, right. if that makes sense. So two people could take a family claim on the same elderly mother. You could have a brother and sister taking claim for their mother, and the same would be true for an affinity relationship if it was the same person. But that one claimant could not have two different affinity relationships in the same year, just how it's written. If that makes sense. Yeah, except the, the, who designates that if it's a minor? If it's a lifestyle. If, if the person is ill, who needs the care as a minor. It just, would be the person to requesting the leave who would be designating the child, not the child. Who will leave for themselves, presumably. No, no, I'm saying if if the say say my I don't have custody of my child who's who's ill and I'm claiming uh, uh, that I have an affinity relationship with that child. My my spouse who has sole custody of that child says, no, you don't. You haven't paid your child support and yet, et cetera, et cetera. Who, who makes that determination? Family court, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's like <laughs> You're out of the picture, but you're claiming it as an affinity. It's like saying, well, I've got a mother, father. I got a uh, elderly mother in your case. I got sister, brother, and then I get neighbor next door saying, oh, I have an affinity claim on the same person. How many people can you have under the same person? There's well, the mother would could decide who who's their affinity person, but if the child is a minor, well, what if they the mother's unconscious? Well, she's got Alzheimer's. How do you? Yeah. I, I'm not. I don't think it goes. Yeah, I, no. I think it's going the wrong way. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about about it as the person who needs the care, right. the affinity. They can have multiple. Person. Right. They yeah. can have different people, but. Just think about your, your employees. I need time off work to care for this person I have an affinity with because they're in a coma or they have Alzheimer's or they're a dependent child. And I mean, presumably, if you don't, if if your if your ex is not allowing you to care for the child, that would be hard to get leave to care for the child. But I don't think so, it's, it's not the child or the person with the Alzheimer's who's choosing. The, the question is really about is somebody checking upon that claim. That your your claim to that affinity relationship with your child that you have nothing to do with is legitimate, and you're taking a leave for the right reasons, right? Like that's a vacation. Yeah. But if you're still like the legal father, doesn't that mean it's family, not an affinity yeah. claim? I, and I think uh, Dr. Navalov saying, what if it's not a traditional relationship? So maybe it was a parent, uh, you know, through. Uh, same sex non marriage situation, and now they're broken up and 10 years later, right? Right, and, right. and, and you know that that child's sick, so you're going to try to take it. And, and, and that I would say might default to some sort of fraudulent, you know, use, but would have to be reported. So, and, and probably you're right, it's probably you know, one tenth of one percent of the claims. So, well, yeah, more than with any other I mean, I, I think those scenarios would play out with any absolutely, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and if, Joan, Joan and then Jenny had their hands up. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I shared on behalf of the Bureau of Insurance the comments that they shared via the PFML uh, rulemaking, but um, their recommendation is uh, to require some sort of proof 
of an affinity relationship through demonstration of some type of shared responsible responsibility, property or life duties. Um, so just sharing that as a, a suggestion. Well, if you look at this as proof of personal identity, proof of identity of family member, but when you get to affinity, it just says information. So I don't know if we can just say proof there too. This is the suggestion. No, I understand. <laughs> I just mm -hmm. happen to, it says proof, proof, and then information. Then ultimately, it's a question does it, will the DOL have staff enough? Is that budgeted for looking at each of these claims? Because I'm guessing at the beginning, it'll be. Well, first of all, we're vending this. Uh, but I think, <laughs> yeah, 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 I need to have a point, I think. Yeah, yeah, Jim. yeah I jumped in. Um, so <laughs> I, I have a question, and it's related to this because, like, the, 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 the the example that was being provided, I feel, is defined as family member, but family member, as being pointed out, is not really used for both tools. And I realize I believe that goes back to the discussion of the last meeting that because that definition may change, they refer to it. But as an employee, um, what would I be looking at? These rules or something else? And I think it would be cool of us to make sure that when an employee is looking at the rules and they want to know if they're eligible, that they don't have to research and figure out how to get to where they're going to figure out whether or not their aunt who they've been taking care of qualifies as a family member or an affinity. But so that would be my question is should should it be more explicit if that's where an employee is going to go? It also makes it easier for an employer if an employee has more information and can make these decisions and then everybody is based on their decision making on the same information as opposed to worrying about whether or not we're going to have to go to court over whether someone can take time off to take care of their kid. And just a quick comment, I do, I think, reiterating what someone else said, but I think there should be at least as much proof necessary for affinity as there is for family members. Or documentation. I'm sorry, right. Right. I think any proof is difficult sometimes. Yes. I mean, sorry, no, 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 sorry. no Whatever that word is, it seems looser than even family member. Mm -hmm. right. um, I just have a suggestion on the definition under number two affinity relationship. Nowhere in here does it say that it's a person. I don't want a bunch of people filing claims on their dogs. You know, I think you might want to say it's and then. Well, I mean, Nancy, we think individual signifies. Yeah, and an individual. Yes, an individual means a person. Can I? Oops, go ahead. Can I just um maybe this uh, as opposed to maybe some theory, but a technical uh, question. Um, so I understand that the that we're trying to differentiate between family member and affinity. Affinity is not in statute, but in rule. No, no, no. So. The word affinity, the uh -huh. concept is in statute. Yes. Okay. What I'm saying is that if you is. do a global search in the statute for affinity, you're not going to find it. But in section. Yeah, I see it here yeah. in 850A, it's 19 like that has family member, it's G. That's yeah. what the concept is. Yeah, okay. The concept is there. Yeah, so the concept of the affinity relationship is in 19G uh, statute. Um, and then the idea would be that th that we in rulemaking are trying to further define what that means uh, under the definition of affinity relationship. Am Which I... is actually what's included in language and statute. It says, yeah, in, in accordance with the rule. Right. That's the being defined in rule. Yeah, we're naming it as affinity relationship in the rules. This concept, we're naming it as affinity relationship using the same language and statute. In order to differentiate from family yeah. and to allow for the requirement to designate one affinity exactly. relationship. Yep. Um, well, is there any uh, interest in um, notating that in the rule that it refers back to statute? I didn't catch that real, like, I didn't necessarily get that. That makes sense when I'm asking? Like, you know, you have a lot of referential. Uh, in the Sorry, rules, sorry. there's lots of referential. Yeah. Nancy's nodding her head at me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That just because, like, you know, it helps people not, mm -hmm. you know, to have clarity mm -hmm. that those things are 
that's what that's defining, I guess. Does, um, does the affinity relationship uh, apply for can you use safety for someone with an affinity relationship? Well, safely, yeah, that's a good flag because it's defined that will be the definition of safety. Uh, it says family member, I believe, right? Well, safely, I think, is defined as it's defined in the safety statute and law. And there's a reference there. Um, so, are you asking instead of are you taking family leave in order to provide, for example, housing to someone who's taking safe leave? Or are you saying it's safe? Because I, I'm pretty sure safe leave is that is as it's defined in a different statute. Yeah, safe, safe leave in, so safe leave in the PFML law means leave take, taken um, To keep a family member safe. To keep a family member safe. But right. then it's using to our definition. To keep yourself a family member safe. Yeah. So is the question, can you take safe leave in order to keep a person in an affinity relationship safe? Right, it's like the first rule um, 6A4 suggests that only family leave is available for people in an affinity relationship. So I was wondering about safe leave, military leave. You know, um, yeah, so I'm looking at the statute um, <clears throat> in the definition of safe leave is leave taken because a covered individual or a covered individual's family member is a victim of. And we've already just family member includes the affinity relationship. So I would say yes. So I'm just I'm I'm wondering whether the proposed rules should include reference to that because um because it seems to suggest that to be eligible for an affinity if there's an affinity relationship you have to provide proof that you need um, to take family leave. And does proof require acceptance by the Person. Sorry. Obviously, in cases of Alzheimer's or a minor, no. But that proof be part of it? I'm not sure this answers your question, but uh, so so in the proposed rules, this is under the process for application and approval for benefits. Um, it says you know, the requested information and I guess it says may include. But when it speaks it speaks to information designating an affinity relationship, if the applicant is applying for family leave to care for an individual with a serious health condition, then the applicant has an affinity relationship. So it doesn't talk about other types of leave. Um, so that could be it just could be confusing about. Yeah, that might be something to clarify. I'm thinking mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. could be safe leave or military leave specifically for an affinity relationship. Right. Yeah. Right. It it is part of the safely statute that an affinity relationship is considered a family member. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, it's like it's a good looks like it was copied. It could be clarified. It could be clarified out of the way though. So yeah. yeah. It's a good flag. Mm -hmm. And, and the, there are a couple of other places where um I think it's six A eight. To be eligible, you have to provide documentation of a family member's serious health condition. Maybe this goes to somebody who said maybe we should put maybe the rules should have include the definition of family member just so that it's easier to understand. Because um, I think there's a question about well, what about affinity relationships? They are family members, but it's yeah. not clear in the rules. Um, notice under 5A. Notice may be provided by a family member or healthcare provider. Presumably, that would include somebody with an employment relationship who could provide the notice. Um, and the authorization statement that a family member must, must authorize the administrator to obtain medical information about them if they're the ones being cared for. Presumably, that's also somebody with an employment relationship. I 
Anything else on affinity relationships? All right, let's move on to wages. Wages including self-employed, I think was something that was raised at the last meeting. I guess one question could be, I think under the self-employed, it uh, they base it off your your taxes, what the IRS thinks you make. So say you're a small, if you're self-employed, you're a plumber, you gross a hundred thousand, you got one hundred twenty thousand in depreciation. You're showing that you lost twenty thousand dollars, whether you did or didn't. I'm, it's not for me to decide. Uh, do they qualify? Because ultimately, if you, you take six times the weekly sixty-six hundred dollars, roughly, if you make that yeah, in, yeah. in four quarters, you yeah. qualify. What about the self-employed that showed losses the last two years? That's total income. Yeah, I would think not that way. So I think the. Um... I think the rule, um, so it's a couple of weeks ago, and I've done 10,000 things since then, but um, you cite to a federal statute. So I presume you cite to an IRS. Statute. That's right. That's what you were pointing to, right? Right. It, it so cites, yeah. it cites that. So does, is it going gross so wages or is it going cite bottom to line? an IRS definition. So. Are you saying, Sam, so you pay yourself X amount, but then well, based, out, based, yeah. on the, based on the records, you're, you're right. It depends if you pay yourself a salary loss, right. or not. Yeah. yeah, you know, if you're paying yourself a salary, I would say that you would qualify, but it literally it flows through the income statement that whatever's left at the end of the year is your salary. Yeah. Well, you know, some you, you see this a lot, like in the woods industry. There's a ton of depreciation because they have all the equipment. So at the end, of the, you know, they might show negative, so they wouldn't qualify for this benefit. So the wages up here or the wages down here? I think that's a great question that we'll have to take into consideration. I don't know that I have an answer. Right. Do you have a proposal on I don't. that? I <laughs> don't. have an opinion on how, how it should be handled. So that, okay. can I read what, so what 26, what, what the code says, the 1402B says, the term self-employment income means the net earnings from self-employment derived from an individual during any taxable year, except that it shall not include and then there's um, a bunch of stuff that doesn't include. Is depreciation listed there? I don't. I mean, I'm reading this on my phone. It's very hard to say. I mean, I, I would think the self-employed people should know the section of IRS law quite frankly. They, they should. They <laughs> should. Everyone should know as much about this statute as, as we do, but they won't. Where is that reference? What's that called? So it's um. So if you look on the second page of the rule and the definitions, it's in um. It's twenty three wages for self employed individuals. Um, okay, it says okay. it has the same meaning as twenty six USC uh -huh. section fourteen o two b. And fourteen o two a says what income is, and fourteen o b says um what self employment in income is. Okay, so that needs further further consideration. Think, think, think about, about it. it. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if there's any language proposal, it certainly passes along. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean people uh I mean I think we just 
you know, everyone wants to be prepared for questions that people will naturally have. You know, I'm self-employed. Do I count? What do I count? How do I count it? You know, people are going to ask. Um, so. Right, and if you opt in, you have to opt in for three years. I think but, it, but it goes year to year basis whether you qualify or not. Yeah, so the opt in for three years is because you it's a trust fund, remember. So like mm -hmm. if somebody's yeah. opting in and then opting out. So if somebody opts in, takes a claim, and then yeah. after 12 weeks opts out, like you 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 want to prevent not people going selection. in and out of yeah, after selection. You want to jump prevent people jumping in and out of an insurance pool because the whole point is they should be paying in a little bit to have some skin in the game. Well, but what about with self-employed people who are like I mean, I understand like if it's your full-time job and that's your career, but a lot of people, you know, have side hustles, for example. And so, um, but those side hustles could be lucrative, uh, but they may go in and out of them, right? Like, so let's say I'm self-employed, um, then I could opt in, um, but then I stop doing that work um, because maybe I get a job. Or something um and then you're still paying in for your job so that's cool so but then that three years is kind of like and goes away right i think there's a provision in there that if your employment status changes it can be um three years can be curtailed yeah i believe i think it, we've had drafts of this but i think that's still in there um so if you're self-employed and then you go get get a job within that three years you can you can have your three-year opt-in exempted Mm -hmm. or, or curtail them. Well, you'd have to be because you wouldn't be making any money anymore and therefore you'd have no wages to be taxed, right? Exactly. right? Thank you. Okay, and sorry, this, yes, uh, just a quick, um, and maybe I'm wrong, double check it, but self-employed is net, but yeah. employees is gross. Mm -hmm. Just right. trying to figure why that is. Just throw it out there. And it, it seemed to me in reading the statute that, and so it's mostly for information. If I'm an employee and I have bounced from job to job over the course of, of a year, but my net income, my wages qualify me, is, is there a waiting period for each job or am I qualified if, as long as I make the, the right amount in each quarter? Yeah, it's a wage threshold. It's, it's meant to be portable. That was a, a big portable. intent of this the statute okay. is that it's a coverage that follows you as long as you're employed in Maine. Um, it makes any wage. Yeah. And then is it prorated per? Say you were, you had four jobs in one year. Yeah. And you paid in at yeah. each of those. You go to collect. Is it the last employer so that's it's, paying, or is it prorated? So the average weekly wage is defined. It's the last four completed quarters of the last five. Right. So it's looking at your income pooled for the whole previous year. Right. Okay. So it's not like chargeability for employment. Because the employers and the workers are paying in all along. Right. So you don't go, there, I got you. being charged. Right. It's a pool of money. Yeah. yeah, Jenny, because I didn't think this would be an issue, but since we asked the rules, what about employees who don't have the right to earn minimum wage and may actually be earning less than this? So there is a wide, so there may possibly be a large amount of people doing hard work in the state who are not eligible and employers can skate on it. So, so minimum wage, is that the question? Yeah. I think that's covered in our wages, correct, Nancy? That's defined. Yeah, I mean, wages, wages are all wages and wages yeah. are gross income. So you are correct. People who make less money make less money, and people who aren't covered by minimum wage. I mean, that's a minimum wage issue, not a yep, and now it's your. But, but wages are still captured as wages that they, they right. can benefit from, yes. Right. But, and they're, but I'm asking if that mathematical, if they're making less than minimum wage because they're not required by law to be able to receive pay. Yeah. They probably aren't going to meet that threshold, correct? Mathematically? Well, it's the 6600 for a year. Yeah, 6600 divide if you're paying $10 an hour. I mean, they should be able to hit that threshold, even if you're paying $10 an yeah, hour. Yeah, you should be. I mean, not, it's the that employer 60, that's no, not necessarily required to provide a pay stub. Still wages as we define it, I believe. Okay. 
So who will be making sure that these employees are accounted for? Is it gonna be you all? We have to audit it, yeah. And you will be doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, that goes to the question, if you have an unsophisticated business that's paying low wages and cash, they're not gonna be sophisticated enough to sign up for this program anyway, and they're gonna be living in the outliers anyway. You're gonna to have to hammer on them. Or you you have a sophisticated business that knows exactly how to pay less for yeah. the people doing the work. That's yeah. my concern, and that's my sector. Yeah. So I just wanna know. We do I, have audit positions. It's gonna be a lot of chasing down, but yeah, we would expect that it, oh, well, the wages are covered. Yes, they are from the book. We are talking about, yeah. we're talking about uh, under minimum wage, we're talking about restaurants? No, we're talking about our mm -hmm. people in the state, the uh, agriculture, who are not 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 required to pay minimum wage due to the veto. Ag workers. Okay. So, I, again, at our yeah. last meeting, this wasn't an issue because right. I had yeah. thought that. We but the, as covered, it's covered in our definition of wages. Mm -hmm. We do have audit positions. We're going to have to chase those people down. Okay, great. Um, so, a lot of work, yes. Do you want me to go back to self to self employed? I'm sorry, because I hear mm -hmm. something else. Sure. So self employed is net, it's net after deductions. And to the point of wages for individuals is gross. It's like, yes, it's gross because it's gross before the taxes come out. Whereas for self-employed, if it were gross, it's the deductions that come out are the deductions that are part of running the that business expenses, right. that an employee's employer pays, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. That's, that's why there's a difference. Thank you. But it's still but net might be negative. but 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 net for self-employed is still before they pay their income tax so in that respect it's akin to gross for an employee Thanks. what if it's negative because they've lost money last year they can't participate because they don't meet the thresholds right that's what i'm saying that's yeah. the question right right let's so say they took in a million dollars and Cash flow wise, they're okay, but cruel accounting wise, because of depreciation, capex, and all those deductions, mm -hmm. they're negative, and then they don't qualify. Meanwhile, they need, they want to be able to qualify for this program. Well, whether the business makes money or not, that doesn't matter. No, that doesn't matter. No, no but what I'm saying is wages, right. unless it's self. -employed. I'm saying self-employed. Self period. So you don't want, you know, say you take in a hundred thousand in gross, they're not one, they're not gonna want to pay the half a percent on a hundred thousand. But they still could be under that threshold at a net level, then they don't qualify. It's just there just needs to be some clarification there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would definitely welcome proposal. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> well, yeah, I'll talk to some small self-employed folks. Yeah, that's definitely the uh, definition uh, that's referenced in the rule uh, for what income is. It's pretty complicated and includes lots of weird things about, you know, rental income and agricultural and tenant labor and church employee income. <laughs> I mean, there's just like a huge amount of stuff. So, further discussion about wages. Okay, let's move on to the definition of healthcare provider. Can I add one thing to this? It, so definition of healthcare provider, and then is this going to add to you guys in your field that you know I get I get discharged from the ER for cutting my hand because I'm clumsy with knives or whatever, and you get the just discharge and it has like what I need to do. Will you have to add you need this amount of help from someone to, you know what I mean? To, to show the proof, you know, I have true bypass, yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. say right. you really need full-time care for the first three weeks of triple bypass surgery. Yeah, I mean, Is there going to be a line item well, that you have to add? Discharge, to discharge? often include the amount of what you're gonna need for post-op right. care, post right. Procedure, so they never care about me enough. So, that, well, you know, <laughs> you're self, you're self yeah. <laughs> so I think this one, I'm hoping it's not going to be a big lift for medical providers <clears throat> because basically it's just going to be what they are doing now for the federal right. unpaid FMLA. Okay. They're going to get a letter saying this person is unfit to work or unable to work due right. to a medical condition between this date and this.
just did. Right. Like we're, we're that one, we're just straight benchmarking it right. in a way. Um, so it's a medical certification that you can't work based on a serious medical condition right. for this period of time or need a reduced work schedule for this period of time. Right. So it's something they're doing for the federal program. Just also for but us. today, I only worry about the person that's injured. Now I need to worry about the person who needs to take care of the person that's injured. Yeah, so they, do will that. they do that for FMLA, too. Okay. Yeah. And and is there a list of who is a health care? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn statute. Yeah, it's right here. Down by bring, that's my favorite part of these whole rules. Uh, <laughs> answered in black and white. I can give you MD, EO. It lists all the certifications. Naturopath. Naturopath. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to quote. Don't, yeah. don't quote me. It's in the statute. I didn't see naturopath in there. Yeah. It's whatever the FMLA standard of acceptable medical sources. Um, and there's a whole bunch of certifications in there. I don't want to say something that's not in there, but it, it does have a list of about 20 acceptable <laughs> medical sources. Each of whom would lobby the list for the yeah, for that. Well, <laughs> Federal acceptable medical source is good enough for us. Further discussion on healthcare provider okay. undue hardship. What is that talk about there? <laughs> good time for coffee. I'm going coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the rules that came out, I'm a little bit more clear where we're trying to get with the undue hardship. So I'll say there was some work done there. That was pretty good. I can make that happen. Yeah. I know. I do have one blue I think it would be beneficial for me and maybe others. We have a whiteboard here. Could we go through the timeline of how this, because we've got, you have, you can only claim 60 days ahead of time. Yeah. You got 90 days. Yeah. They put the claim in. Yeah. They put the claim in with you directly. Do they ha have to, they have to give 30 days notice to the employer, but then you're going to give a five day notice after, the after that. Just and then the didn't. employer has 10 days to rebuttal or whatever you want to call it. Yes. Do I have all the... You got it. <laughs> yeah. you got it. That's a great word to call yeah. like Professor Thank Heights. you for reading the rule. <laughs> yeah, you're so right. I, you, you nailed it. You can, yeah. you can put in 60 days before you want to take leave and up to 90 days after. The employee should give at least 30 days reasonable notice. Should. Should. So should. Um, so if they don't, you know, the administrator, once we have an application, is doing a notification to the employer within five, five days. days. And then I have 10 days or 50 You days. have 10 days to put in a rebuttal that, oh, this is undue hardship and here's why. Right. Or this person doesn't work for me and I think it's not. <laughs> right. Uh, Please tell us that right away. <laughs> uh, so then is there going to be a scoring rubric on the other side? Like, oh, they, they scored uh, 90 out of 100 in the undue hardship. Well, yeah, that's, where, that's where it comes down to adjudication. Then right. after the 10 days, we have all the information right. to adjudicate the claim. Right. Um, and then, I mean, I'm hoping that most employees have a good relationship with employers. Mine do, but most places be messy ones, uh, they're, 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 yeah. right. So hopefully there is that communication. But I'm just wondering about these companies that don't have that communication. They wake up one morning, they're like, "Oh, these five people just," you know. And that's why there's the employer notification in the ten days to rebut. Yeah. Can I um, comment on the timing of the notification aspect? So, um, on I, I'm. I'm assuming part of this like notification is going to kind of feel like unemployment um, a little bit. And maybe I'm wrong, but like in terms of notification and everything. And um, so I use sides, you know, I signed up for sides for my employee, not my employer notifications. Um, and especially in that circumstance, you know, maybe someone has been laid off and you no longer have contact with that person. So you really do need that notice coming from the state because they're not telling you anything anymore. And um, so I signed up for sides. And so, but yet for some reason, I only sometimes get notifications and then I still get notifications in the mail, even though I signed up for sides. And then I have to, you know, it's, it's very confusing to me as an employer, how to deal with all those notices I get, even though I signed up for the electronic notices that I mean, maybe I have to continue to sign up for them over time. I, I'm not sure. So, 
then the mail, you know, is very slow, takes over a week to get to me frequently because the postal service is understaffed. So I'm just concerned about that timing because like if I don't get that notice, it it I think with sides, it like does some sort of external mailing on a third party mailer service and it doesn't go out really fast. So I'll get letters dated two weeks earlier um, before they end up in my mailbox. And so I'm just concerned that 10 days when I'm seeing that on those delays in sides, and then I only have 10 days and it's an employer, like that doesn't feel like very long when there's a delay of notification. No, that's fair. <clears throat> so a lot of the process next year will be developing obviously process like how we're going to do all these things like we're going to bend this out probably um and then user-centric design how is this going to work for employer notifications we're trying to minimize paper obviously because of mm -hmm. the days but some people still rely on paper um the 10 days you know the, the thing to remember is like we want that employer rebuttal time because it's in statute on the undue burden and also the claim is being held at yeah. the time and that's an important sure. thing to remember is that most states I think there's only one other state I know of that even has an employer review, um, and it's Massachusetts. Um, so during this 10 day, the claimant's uh, claim is being held with no decision. Um, so our processing time is already going to lag behind other states by nature of undue burden, which is fine. You know, we fit in the statute, we need to meet that obligation. Um, but I'd be very wary about holding it for longer than 10 days. And I think it's up to us really come up with a system. And Massachusetts, again, have, they, they do have an employee notification. They use an online portal. Um, you know, I think that's very user-centric design. I think it's something we want to aspire to. Paper, I know, has delays, but some people rely on it. Um, yeah, I think if, I think that, that that electronic notification, like if, if we can learn from anything to make that as quick as possible to the employer, I totally agree with you. You can't like let this linger forever because the postal service is slow. But, um, but where I have the problem is our current like side system, I feel is lacking. And I'm just hopeful that what we are doing with paid family leave isn't duplicating it that inefficiency. That. I, mean, it's, I don't know what sides is, but whatever. It's the unemployment. Okay. Yeah. So I appreciate the, the notification on sides. So oh, sorry. Or, and I said that you're lacking notifications coming from sides. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really confused by it. Unemployment folks and find out what's happening. Yeah, so I just, you know, I think, um, I know like the main revenue service just updated their whole system yeah. and um, it's dupl duplicative of the system in Massachusetts. It looks very similar to me. Um, and that's been going well for me. So um, as an employer. Have we set up RFPs yet for whoever's so we, we have an RFP out for the, so we have two big systems we're creating, and I'd say systems. One's a technology system to collect contributions, like the actual premium. Right. We don't have a mechanism for people to pay us yet. That RFP is out and we're in contract negotiation with the vendor right now, and I can't say who because we're in contract negotiations. Um, that's to build us a system, hopefully by January 1st, roll out so that as of April 1st, people can actually pay us money um, online through a system, and we can track and collect wages. The secondary system is the actual claims adjudication so that who's going to do the adjudication of claims and collect the applications and pay the benefits um and like we said previously we are going to go out to rfp for that that one we're going to be working on this fall with, with hopes of getting out late fall uh, winter um which would give us we're hoping a year with that better to train them i know some people are concerned about timeline but connecticut's a similar state they're the only state that's gone this direction they had six months with their vendor we're going to have a year um so it's, it's tight, but it's still absolutely doable. So that RP, the secondary, the big one, will go out this winter for the, the actual claims adjudication. So does that mean that the, that group will be deciding the comment of undue hardship as it relates to the nature of the industry? They would be doing the claim adjudication. It would be the third party administrator with state oversight. So I mean, that's the one that caught my eye. Oh, that, that's sorry. It's the nature of the industry involved. So that means that if I'm a medical person and I say, geez, I can't go without that hygienist for my company, or is it a butcher that, that a store relies on, or is it, how, how does somebody make that determination that 
my industry is more important than your industry, or whether it's a chicken processor. That's about really it's about seasonality. It's about, about seasonality. If there's fluctuations in, in your workload, for instance, based on season, it's not about importance. Oh, it's not the nature of the industry involved. Oh, okay. Okay. So nobody's going to be deciding that, hey, I, I'm relying on this person to run my plan. And I can't be without them for three months. I think that's yeah. exactly that, what it is. That, right? that is the case. Yeah. yeah. But it's not about valuing uh, one yeah. industry over another industry. That's what I heard you say. Oh, okay. So okay. It's, right. It would be about, I have a seasonal business, for instance, and I can't do without this position during this time. And is so is is there any flexibility in that? Is the individual does the individual have any flexibility, and how does that match up against the the seasonality of the business? I think that's the intent. Got it. And so if you contract this out, no one at main DOL looking at any of these claims, only if it gets to a point where they need to. Wait a second. Well, all the appeals will go to us. It's the, the appeals will go back. Yeah. Well, it, sorry. The initial claim will be with the vendor. Yeah. There will be a reconsideration claim. That's a quick fix. Um, you know, it's called a reconsideration claim. So it's a chance for the, the administrator, the first person taking a look to take a second look with a second set of eyes. Usually that's in somebody's favor to reverse a decision if there's an error quickly. If the reconsideration is denied, then it goes to the state appeal process, which will be our hearing unit. Um, and then from there, if they want to push it, it's Administrative Procedure Act, you know, so you can go to the courts if you wanted to, to, it's a public decision at that point, so. What is other states' experience with the undue hardship? There is no other state that has undue hardship. We are charting new territory. And that's a that's good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is brand new in the land of PFML, because we are the first state to have this provision. How, how has it worked with earned paid leave, or is this something that has come up? I mean, I know it's it, those rules are are not not as <clears throat> thoughtfully uh, spelled out, I think, as these. It's shorter. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is that has that come up? At, at I'm sure would have to you. Yeah. So I mean, earned so earned paid leave is that you get um, an hour for every week for basically paid time off. It could be sick. It could be vacation. It could be whatever. It could be because your car breaks down on the way to work. Your babysitter's sick. <laughs> Um, so earned paid leave, the undue hardship is, um, you know, the undue hardship is this, the scheduling. So that, for instance, the thought when, um, the thought when the earned paid leave rules were being done about undue hardship, the thought was that, that there are certain employers who have blackout dates. You cannot take vacation during these weeks, for, for example. So that was the thought of earn pay leave because it was also the thought that earn, unless it's an emergency, right. meaning an illness, because the thing was the undue hardship in earn pay leave was for taking a vacation, which is voluntary when a person is, is planning it. So that's where the concept arose. So no, you have a blackout date. You're not allowed, you're an accountant. You're not allowed to take vacation during February, March or, or, or April. I, I guess I guess my, my question was a little different was just whether the Department of Labor whether there were any issues with, with people dealing with the undue hardship part of our paid leave. It's one thing there haven't are, been a huge amount of complaints that um that the Bureau of Labor Standards has gotten about undue hardship and our paid leave. Not aware of any complaints yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Same. As a general ask. We're talking about just the statistics in the other states that affinity was only 1% or whatnot. Do you know the percentage uh, planned versus emergency and sudden? No, but I can ask. I'm, I'm just yeah, curious. The states are great about just giving us data, but I can ask. Because that would help us frame the undo because that is pulled out of undo, obviously, because you can't. Right. Absent yeah. absent an emergency unless there's sudden necessity of taking leave. Uh, I do think it's 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 helpful in the in the detail that it gives more of a roadmap to explain to employers about what, what does it mean, what would they have to be required to show and that, that there is a process to help folks work it out if they can't do it on their own. I think that's, that's a 
is thoughtful. I just hope that it, under the tight time frames that people might need to take the leave, that there's the staffing to deal with those decisions expeditiously. Um, can I ask really quick, um, you mentioned the RFPs going out for premium collection and the second one for claim adjudication. Yeah. Um, so the premium collection uh, piece of it, uh, which starts a lot earlier, um, I was reading the uh, penalties to employers who don't file timely. And um, so I'm just curious, like uh, how we can help employers make sure that doesn't happen to them. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, especially in the beginning when it's a new process for them, um, are there going to be like, uh, is the plan to have some sort of uh, linkage with payroll companies yes. so the payroll company can kind of be in charge of doing that for their customers? Yeah, the NPRC, the National Payroll Coalition, has been hugely helpful for us. Okay. Um, and I think they're the ones, you know, once we have a system, if we can involve them in the design, that's we want to do that as well. But at least once the system is up and running. If we can get payroll companies on board with what we're doing and how to get linked up, um, they say it's between 85 and 90 percent of employers main use payroll companies. So if we have them on board, yeah. that's going to hopefully lead to 85 to 90 percent immediate compliance. <laughs> and well, that's the other 15 percent we're going to reach. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a small business, um, you know, I've always told anyone who asks me, I'm in charge of our, uh, I'm our CFO. And and I have a huge accounting background and I yeah. understand how to do all these things, but I do not do my own payroll. You know, like I have Bangor payroll, they do it for me, they pay my taxes, because yeah. I do not want to not pay my taxes by accident because that's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's I'm like, that's great if I can get them to do it for me. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they were some of the first people to call us. You know, right. I think Reggie was hired and he got calls from payroll companies. Like they're, they're very proactive. Great. Um, we've been in discussion and as soon as we know what we're doing with the, the system, we want to make sure they know because that's going to only help our compliance. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the yes. third party administrator here, DOL will send them kind of this one through nine to help them decide whether there's undo or will undo so, end up in DOL or. or they're going to be taking the applications. Right. We're training them in our rules and process. Right. So we're going to jointly develop, you know, training materials and process guides with them. Um, and ultimately, they're going to take the claim to the adjudication with our public oversight and appeals. And then as appeals happen and appeals decisions come down, that training will then also evolve. Right. Like, it's like, whoa, we have appeals on this. You're going to fall. Right. Let's stop doing it that way. So when you go out to RP or when you, you pick the company, will you make this one through nine a little bit more thorough, like size employer? Well, I mean, we're still in rulemaking, so right. any of that can change. But I think the other, you know, the balance we talked about last time is not getting overly prescriptive and rule. A lot of this is absolutely going to be developed in process guides yeah. um, and forms. Like, we don't want to put specific forms in the rules. We don't want to update rules every time we want to update a form or a specific process. You know, so rules are really giving us the broad framework of what we're doing. Um, and then a lot of work, once we finalize the rules, will be filling in the, the blanks with process and guides and FAQs um, to kind of fill it in even more. So, so if, you, uh, if you come back with a vendor that, when reading the rules, says this may be non-standard in, in the processes, you know, in, in our experience, let's say, um, we go back and revisit the rules once a vendor is selected and modify the rules or we can always go to the rules. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And even statute can be changed. You know, all these things can be changed. It's just a different process. Yeah. Any discussion on undue hardship? Okay. Notice notice to employer. It's another topic. That's a 30 day thing. Is that what we're talking about? Well, that, that was a timeline I kind of gave there. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, so you, can't, <laughs> you can't apply before 60 days. You have 90 days after the fact. And then once you apply, DOL has five days to notice, uh, notify the employer, and the employee employer has 10 days after that for rebuttal. My question is, 
Is that reasonable? Can I ask where did the 60 days, so 60 days that an employee has to before their uh, you know, date of leave start yeah. to start their claim with the vendor? Yes, that the 60 days? 60 days before they have a potential leave they want to take, they can apply up to 60 days beforehand and up to 90 days after. The 60 and 90 are statutory. Okay. And I think the five day after a claim is also statutory. Um, but I'm pretty yet, everybody's nodding. Um, so the five day after a claim is also statutory. So the only time frame we added was we clarified 30 days as reasonable notice if it's foreseeable in the 10 day rebuttal period for the employers. So the only two that were actually left up to rulemaking was the reasonableness of 30 days and the 10 day rebuttal period for uh, the employer. Everything else is statutory. So my question is, uh, somebody calls in 60 days before their intended date of leave, is that when is their eligibility expected to be determined? As the date they call in or as of the date that they're expected to take leave? And like when is it? Payments, what are uh, the payments from? Uh, when will they hear a determination? Yeah, um, maybe I'm not asking the question correctly. So, I guess, uh, if they're a new employee, is it are they eligible day one as a new employee? If they have the wage threshold, yeah, if they have the wage threshold. So, if they come from a job and they have already met the wage threshold, they're eligible day one. If they don't, they have. They have to have four quarters of rent. Right? They need to meet that six times the average weekly wage wage threshold, okay. and so, so they'll meet that at the time frame depending on how much money you need. Correct. Yep. So for those for employees that fall into that their initial determination for eligibility, um, and they haven't met that when they call in their their leave request sixty days in advance. Oh, I see what you're asking. Yeah. Um, and I ask this because when if they're denied, yeah. is it based on the date that they call in or that, because if that's the case, they could be issued a denial when they may 60 days later meet that that's question. threshold. I would read that read that as what I think the rules say is that you need to have met the wage threshold to even apply. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so you have to covered individual. Yeah, you're covered individual. So you must have had that wait. So let's just say you're moving to Maine for the first time. Yes. So you have no wages in Maine. Yes. You start day one and you know you want to have a baby in 60 days, you cannot apply. Um, you need to wait till you have the, the wage threshold and then you can apply. And whether that date is a week in the future or another 60 days in the future, you can't even apply until you meet the wage threshold is how I read the rules. So the notice requirement wouldn't apply to that individual? Well, they also have to get 30 days notice too. But I'm saying you can't even- So I, I'm not qualified. 60 days from now, I'm going to have, I started a new job, I finally met the criteria i'm going to have a baby in 60 days i can't apply now i can't provide notice now the day after i become eligible i give birth do i have to now wait 30 or 60 days to to take leave because i have to accommodate the notice period you can't apply until you have the wage threshold. That being said, I mean, I think it's a discussion point if people want to think about that. Um, and it definitely would be considered an emergency. Right, right. right. That's what I was thinking at that point. And then it's, yeah. They can't take the Good point. And you said in rulemaking, we can decide on the 30 days and 10 days. Can we put in there they have to give a 30 day notice? Absent of emergency. Well, I mean, it's pretty it's similar to that. Yeah. that. What does it? Yeah. 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 Well, it says it's should. It's I just actually didn't... a question I have because it seems to say if they provide 30 days of written notice, that's presumed to not, not be under hardship. But, but then the rules also say they. You know, provide for if they don't provide the 30 days right. and not in writing. And then, they, then it, there may or may not be an architecture. I think if there's a question about that. Is my reading of it, is that well, so I think accurate? Or, I'm or, going to speak to this. Okay. So, I mean, 30 days is presumed to be reasonable notice. That's what we're saying. But it's not required. 30 days is presumed to be reasonable notice. So, for an employee, that's like their safe harbor. 
but, but in some circum so just to elaborate, in some circumstances, given the nature of the mm -hmm. business and the nature of my job, two weeks notice might be deemed to be reasonable under the circumstances right. of everything. Right. But I'm taking my chances as an employee if I'm not in yeah, a you're taking that case that 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 one I would say, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're opening yourself up to your employer rebutting. Yeah. But I just not, the get... door isn't shut. It's right. not like right. no, 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 it's not going to say. I mean, if the employer doesn't, the employer might, might be fine with it, right? In which case, MDOL doesn't care, right? It's only um, if the employer, it's, yeah, says, yeah right. it's, I can't do this. It's, yeah. But as a it's lay person, sense. I didn't feel like that 30 days, that language was very strong. That was just like a suggestion. Adjudication's messy. So, like, that's why you need to. So you, we can play, we do, and we do, we play the what if game all day. Yeah. But I mean, that's, there's going to be scenarios where, like, they have 30 days and they wish they had more. And there's going to be sometimes that everyone's fine with two weeks. But I think, you know, we wrote it in a way that this is presumed to be reasonable for 30 days. And even the employer, I think there's language in there to challenge that 30 days is not reasonable, but they have a higher threshold, you know, that I needed, I needed 90 days. And here's why. But it's, needed. In legalese, it's a rebuttable presumption. <laughs> and then go back to why you think 10 days should be the max. Um, that you're holding a claim that whole time. Right. So somebody. But they have access. They can tap into other short-term disability or they don't have it to their employer. I'm thinking it. about, okay. let's say, somebody at a variety store um, has a stroke, trying to pay the bills, and we're waiting on the employee or employer, excuse me, 10 days to say. Yeah, but that's so the emergency. 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 Well, let's say, I mean, person at a variety store puts in 30 day notice that they're having a, a emergency surgery on their <laughs> back tumor. They're not planning a stroke. They're not, they're not planning a stroke, <laughs> but they need to get a tumor out. They're putting in 30 days. Right. Um, they're trying to pay the bills and they're waiting that extra 10 days right. um, for their employer to, to not rebut. You know, we're holding a claim that whole time. They're not, right. they're not getting access to money. I'm just saying, say you're the CFO, the CEO. I mean, you have a busy schedule. Can you get all the documentation within that 10 days? Well, so I will do for unemployment claims. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was going to add. So it, it's also a fraud present prevention. So we're holding the claim for the 10 days. Okay. And you may very well come back and say, Kim didn't have a heart attack. She's sitting right here. <laughs> Okay. And that happened a lot during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, yes. Um, so, uh, so on the other side of that, as an employer, um, I'm worried about my employee. I want them to get their money as soon as possible. I, you know, am I allowed as the employer to proactively like approve my portion of whatever I have to do so that the, you know, the uh, team. The TPA is not yeah. waiting 10 days. Yeah. yeah, we've already started talking about it as a process okay. thing. <clears throat> that if the employer wants to like waive their 10 days, like mm -hmm. click a button, like yeah. I'm fine click with it. Button. We already yeah, talked about it. Click a button, mm -hmm. please process Let's their claim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, we, we agree that's a, a good thing to have. They just want to waive the 10 days and nobody's waiting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Further discussion on notice? Okay. Benefit stacking and make whole. It's a mess. It is, and it's <laughs> it's a very oh, dense, can you point there? very dense couple sentences. Um, I don't even know where. What's that? I, I got to find it first. It's, it's only two or three sentences. It's the impact. Here it is. Um, so page five, section B. Number two, like it's hard to even read it, but the intent here is like, we obviously can't dictate federal programs, right? We can't reduce the amount of federal leave that somebody's eligible for. We can't even, you know, dictate the amount of unpaid leave for, for main unpaid leave that somebody's eligible for. What we can do is reduce our leave based on the usage of these other programs. And so that is what we think that two sentences that's very hard to, to read says. Is that if you've taken after the first year, you know, because we're, we're going to have benefits go live May 1st, 2026, and you don't want to penalize per se somebody who um, is taking family medical leave, let's say in, in December of 2025. So after this first year, if we have a, you know, a benefit year that's looking backwards. If somebody has taken federal medical leave in that prior year, 
their pool of paid family medical leave is reduced by that amount of time, if that makes sense, because they're supposed to be run concurrently. And I think an employer has the authority to run federal leave concurrently with paid leave. I'm saying yes. nods from HR. So the company can, can dictate what's federal leave. So if we have paid leave, the company can say, okay, that's also your 12 weeks. Yes. So we can control that and we can reduce, you know, let's say somebody for whatever reason takes 12 weeks of unpaid leave um, doesn't apply for main leave and then tries to apply for main leave for that second 12 or for that second period of 12 weeks. At that point, they have zero with us because they've just taken 12 weeks of federal leave. Their, their available pool of paid leave was reduced by their unpaid time that they did not run consecutively or concurrently. But only for those events that would actually qualify for both. Yeah. PF for, for FML. Yeah, right. The leave in the relationship stuff doesn't apply. Yep. Anybody that's not qualified for FML because the eligibility period is different than the state period. But I think that one, and this is where I start to get confused myself, the, the more restrictive program is FML. Um, so the more inclusive is paid. So Sarah, I'm looking to you to help me on this one. But an employee becomes eligible for the PFML. <laughs> First. before they become eligible right. for so, the FML. So, so they're going to take the page and they're going to reduce because the employer, oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. So they, they can still take 12 weeks. They take their number right? year, yeah. In the first year. Yeah. So this one, if we have- Continue that thought, I missed it. So they, yeah. they can take the federal <laughs> yeah. and not take the main- but So within the first the year, you're eligible for paid family medical leave. You are not eligible for federal medical leave. Right. So you would take the- so, so let's say you take at nine months you take paid family medical leave and then at 12 months you take federal right so you're talking about in the first year of employment at a, an employer a new employer okay but could you, i mean could you just back to doug's point could you take if you're let's assume you you've worked the required amount of time to be covered by federal, federal yeah. and state and your employer is covered by those could you take family and medical leave for like unpaid to care for my mother and then and then paid for an affinity. And that's why your paid has been reduced because you had the unpaid. You just it's reduced and, and the flip side is the same. So if I take if I take the affinity you take the affinity that's it's where it is. Then then yeah. can I take federal? So we can't dictate the federal program. Yeah that's so a that, federal question. Yeah that's a federal, federal question. Question. that's a US DOL question. Yeah. What about what about Maine family leave? Affinity is not on me, I don't believe. No. No. We one. don't know. Okay. Yeah. This is one we would certainly welcome language, but like I think yeah. to the degree that we can control the state program, we've covered it. To the degree that we can't dictate a federal program, we can't dictate a federal yeah, program. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And, and uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Federal program unpaid is just saying 12 weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Just hold job protection. Right. Job protection. Yeah. Employers of 50 or more only. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So the other thing that, that has come up with like the make pool and stacking relates to can can employers top off, for example, you yeah. know, uh, supplemental you know, supplemental. Yeah, that's in there. And that's in um that's on page eleven. That's reduction. Okay. Uh, uh, Tell that to someone else. It's in there somewhere. Okay. It's in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. you, but Yes, so that's to the extent it pays yeah. 66 or, or 90, employers can top off and that's not going to reduce it. Yeah, okay. Page 11, D, 3. Yes, wages, yes, let's top off wages, right? 3, 3D on page 11. That okay. That poses a statutory question. It, it's not specific to staffing, but it does have to do with a, a concern for the language here that. Maybe it's my read, maybe it was unintentional, but wording is in the intermittent leave requirement in statute. And I think it's repeated in the rule. It says the taking of leave intermittently or on a reduced leave pursuant to the subject may not result in a reduction in the total amount of leave to which the covered individual is entitled under this subject. So reading those words, is that- Okay, I'll wait for the next slide. That's okay. I need the other brain. Yeah. Well, because some of it's content too, so maybe it's not a mystery, yeah. depending on the answer to the yeah. question. Yeah, and then, maybe, and then right. can you, so Doug, do you know where intermittent? <laughs> yes, it's an 850B number five. Okay. Look 
Okay. You look at the statute, right? Yeah. Oh, you look at the statute. I'm sorry. I can. So, what you're asking is if they take, so yeah, I mean, if they take. Half a day, it gets reduced to half a day, but it doesn't reduce the total overall amount. That's what I want. I, I think you really need to explain it better. Okay. Um, my, oh, sorry. So I, um, Doug Potnor asked a trick question, and I said that you had to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> So he's really asking about, I don't know where he's going. I was concerned with the, what, the, the language of the statute, actually, and whether this was discussed. In Intermittent leave in, eight, in 850B. Here, yeah, I have my statute in front of me. I can, I can show it to you. What are you looking at? Like this. Yeah. So if you have, uh, you have yeah, the same thing five, I have, no, three, 324. Yeah. So the wording says the taking of leave intermittent leave. Essentially, may not result in a reduction in the total amount of leave to which the covered individual is entitled. That could be read, and it has been read by others that have read. I think intermittent leave this week, four hours, four hours next week, and four hours the next week. It's not counting against my 480 hours of, of available time. Yeah. I, is that the That's event? not how I read it. So I read it as the proration of your available time. So the 12 weeks, for instance, is not, you have 12 weeks out of this calendar year where all your leave must fit. Mm -hmm. You know, I read that as if you're taking two days off per week for the whole year, you're not, once you get past 12 weeks, you still have prorated time in your bank of available to quote unquote 12 weeks. Right, your aggregate time. Your aggregate time. So I aggregate all the leave, it yeah. still cannot exceed 12 weeks. 12 weeks of what your normal work is. Correct, yeah. But what this, what this language and statute reads as mathematically is it may not result in a reduction of the total amount of leave to which I am entitled. I am entitled to 12 weeks of leave. Intermittent leave may not result in a reduction to that time. So that that's the way the statute yeah. is worded right now. We already have which to is that concern. One once already. So we might have and, to and again rule rule can't supersede statute. Yeah. So we can right, clarify and rule but statute well, the statutory interpretation would be that can't be what it means because that would That'd be absurd. And there's there'd be an absurd <laughs> right. result, and that's actually a term of art in case. I, and I don't disagree. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just suggesting yeah, perhaps no, thank we you. consider yes, clarifying the statute clean up. ability mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, yeah, we've already had to clean up that one yeah. subsection once because it was, yeah, it was not clear. So we'll have to do it again, I think. But I, I agree that would be an absurd result. So, so is 12 weeks. Um, when you're thinking about reduced and incremental. Um, so let's say my scheduled work week. I mean, I think a lot of people make these assumptions that a scheduled work week is 40 hours, but that's, you know, not true. Um, so let's say my scheduled work week, which I think it said somewhere that that was based on an average, um, could be based on an average and during the claim process um, is 16 hours a week. Yeah. Um, so now it's it's 12 weeks of leave at a 16 hour a week basis. Yeah. It's whatever that is. I'm not doing that math in my head. Yeah. Um, and then that would then could be spread out in an intermittent basis, 12 times 16. Basically, but Sarah, what can you do? That's how FMLA does it. It's your total yeah. available yeah. bank is based on your what your work week looks like. You know, yes. so your work week might be 80 or your work week might be 16. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just say the other thing is that the intent would be to first start with, do you know what you did have worked in this particular week? Or are you not taking leave? And then the average, the 16 weeks, you know, um, average concept that you're talking about would come into play if the answer to that first question is, well, it's impossible to tell because, mm -hmm. you know, my schedule is all over the so place. Much, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if there is a... If, um, if, for example, the person needs to take a day off and that we, it, it's pretty, if everybody agrees, you would have worked 20 hours mm -hmm. um, and you would have worked the same number, five days a week, equal days. So that's one fifth of the week. Um, and there, there wouldn't be a reason to, to do any sort of look back or averaging or anything like that. The look back and average approach only comes into play, again, for those wildly variable situations. Um, and then it's not necessarily a matter of, I mean, you could think about it just in terms of a 
a theoretical construct of taking the average number of uh, hours times 12, but that's your total type of hours, but it's really more of an analysis of in this week, it's a partial week, what portion of that week are you missing? And that's how you get to the um, proration of the weekly benefit amount and how you get to the portion of the week out of your 12 weeks that you've used. Does that make sense? Kind of. I, <laughs> um, it's hard. I, I can see there needing to be maybe some online tools yes. for yeah. that to enter that so that they can anticipate what they could possibly yeah. be yeah. receiving. Yes. Um, you know, my part time employees who may or may not hit the 60, 600 ish uh, threshold. Um, you know, they have wildly varying schedules. Um, you know, they may not work two weeks and then they may work 16 hours, you know, like it, it's very common um, at my place of business. So yeah, no, that that starts to test my knowledge. The proration system is incredibly complex. And I think we need to break it down with examples once rules are finalized with like mm -hmm. what this actually means with so-and-so's case and so-and-so's case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm mindful of the time. I know that um, we haven't yet talked about private plan and we sure we want to talk about that. There may be some other, some other areas as well. So, um, and there is, so does the, let me question, does the debt, the July 8th deadline applies to written comments? Does it apply to votes by this authority? No, yeah. many comments. So, so if we were to schedule another meeting, we wouldn't have to necessarily do it before July 8th. If we uh, no, sorry, no, it does. All it does com apply. Uh, no, sorry. All comments no, have to be All added. comments need to be in by July 8th, okay. yeah. So I think one question for this group is whether we want to set a meeting prior to the July 8th deadline to be able to Definitely. discuss, yes. further discuss the rules and potentially vote on input. I'm seeing no answer now. Okay. Um, why don't we do that now and then we can at least start the discussion on the on the private plan. Um, I'm going to suggest the last week of June and not the first week of July for selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Canada Day is the first. We can't do it on Canada Day. <laughs> so the week of June 24th? The week of June 24th. Yes. And this this time seems to work for folks. I mean, does the 25th from 9 to 11 work? Yes. Radio AMTC. I've been watching. Okay. Have fun. No, no, I'll be uh, exactly. with other paid leave administrators. So I'll okay. be in my little Super Bowl. With paid leave. <laughs> so you're going to bring back lots of important information for us. A ton of it. <laughs> yes. Are you going yeah. that whole week? Or are you... Yeah, the 24th through the 27th. Okay. Yeah. But I'll but be I'm here, Sarah. You'll be here. Sorry. So I think I would, I would shoot for the 25th. Yeah. Because um, once you get into July, I don't want to go into July don't either. Yeah. July. Does um does, does the twenty fifth at nine not work for anybody here? Doesn't work for me. Does not work for you. Not work. Okay. Ben, does it work for you? Yep, that's fine. Um, you can do. Um, we could, or we could look. Is there another day that I think I could? I'm not available. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. What about Monday the 24th? That works. Uh, Monday the 24th. Time dirty, but I'm available that, day. that day, okay. I can actually load that. I can load in. I can do afternoon. On the 24th? On the 24th, but now Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Maybe. Oh, I see. Okay. So we're not going to, I'm not going to gain you. Maybe my use. You. Okay, but we don't, it doesn't do anything for, for you, Jay, and it doesn't, we don't get it for Jay. So, but if it's just me, then go ahead. I think, I think we may need to, unfortunately. So, the 25th from 9 to 11, I don't know if that works for everybody else. Okay. Thank you for that. All right, so in our remaining time, um, yeah. let's discuss. Private plans. Reading article it seems like that's what the Chamber of Commerce is primarily looking at, what employers are primarily looking at. Uh, because the background there is you can't opt out immediately. You've got to pay for at least 16 months and then they decide if you have a qualifying plan. So, one, 
there any reimbursement? There's no reimbursement. Not as written. Right. That just seems wrong. I mean, that just, the purpose of that is to fund the, the pool, right? Well, so I can give a little bit of a lead time. I mean, it's, 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 true. Yeah, it's a, as we all know, this is a very complex process. Uh, and this, this one thing is probably the most complex of the whole thing. Um, so I think there's fundamental disagreement, you know, at our level right now. Again, this is a proposal. You know, that's why we want to hear from everybody. This is these are draft rules. This is what we propose in draft one. You know, anything subject to change. Um, but I think there's a fundamental disagreement that businesses, whether they opt in or out, don't ultimately benefit from the fund because they don't opt out of the fund forever. They opt out of the fund for three years at a time. And if they find, you know, that the public plan is is cheaper down the road. They're allowed to come right back into the plan without a waiting period, um, or if their plan is found to fail, and we have to, you know, revoke the, the, the substitution. They're brought back into their fund. Their employees are covered without a waiting period. Um, so, so will this cause employers to break from? So for those sixteen months, they said, "Well, I don't want to pay both plans right now." I think Northern Lights said it was about a million dollars a month that they. Well, so proportionally, in. everybody's paying the same. So, I mean, if you're making a million dollars a month paying, it's still 1% of your payroll. No, totally. I, yeah. But a million dollars for a hospital is pretty good. Yeah. So, are you going to, are they going to pay both plans or do they opt out of their current one so, and then jump over to this one? And then, and again, this is, is as proposed, we're, we're open to anything, but people have what exists now. Right. And then everybody's being asked to pay into this trust fund for the next 16 months. And for most people, without access to any benefits, you know, right. everybody's paying into this trust fund, you know, at their corner variety store without being able to pull benefits from it for the first 16 months. Some employers have some level of plans. And I think even the things that were coming up yesterday, people were mentioning like, well, I have four weeks of paid family leave. You know, that's that's something that's not substantially equivalent. Four weeks right. is not 12 weeks. So people that have something are still probably going to have to augment it. You right. know, there might be people out there that have full 12 weeks for medical leave and family because i think yeah, a lot of things when people say you know i have family leave they're talking about you know four weeks paid leave or they're 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 not including family leave whatsoever so i still think there needs to be tweaks for whatever exists out there um right now and that's going to be cost that's going to be you know um self-insurance if you're self-insuring you still have to bond it you still have to write your your plan your insurance plan to the regulations of the rules once they're adopted um but everybody has whatever they have out there now, and then everybody's being asked to pay into something that they can't pull benefit from. That being said, everything's up for negotiation. This is draft one. You know, so it's it's an important decision. This obviously has monetary impact. Um, I think it has fairness impacts, and I think there's disagreements on the fairness on either side. Um, and just logistically, you know, we haven't even finalized rules yet. So how could we even know? That's my worry is that people are guessing that these things might be substantially equivalent. What happens if we get to a scenario where they've opted out for a year, their plan is denied, and now they owe us, you know, $16 million. Are they gonna pay that willingly? Right. You know, and are we gonna be in messy appeals, you know, with individual companies for years? Jen, I, I just point. thank you. <laughs> I haven't gotten to speak on this at all. So. <laughs> You say everyone is contributing, and in my understanding, business owners with less than a certain number of employees yeah, sorry. are not, but they're their not, employees yes. are. Yes. Right. So I think it's important to not say everyone. Yes, you're true. Because when I look at my peers, yeah. I know which ones aren't. Yeah. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Uh, you're, you're right. I'm sorry. I misspoke on that. I like what you said. That makes more sense mm. than uh, So that was really good. Question though, could we do an application period earlier so that you would be able to see this company is legitimately in? You know? And that's that's the question, I think. You know, because private plans, they need to be created once rules are finalized and fully insured. You know, the insurance companies are waiting for us to finalize, I would imagine. Um, you know, ACLI has said that they need to know what the regulations are to create products. You know, I know BOI is, is great partners, they're gonna they're rare at it, but like we still need to jointly come up with checklists and check for these compliance. Um, self-insurance, you know, I think that's a little bit of a smaller bucket. Um, you know, that things might be able to be adapted quicker, but even then, like they still have to write a plan, they have to write an insurance plan and bond it. Um, this is not just an insure, uh, an employee policy. This is not just something that can change on a Tuesday. It needs to be an insurance plan that you're bonding to the state so that if you fail, the plan fails, you owe us the money that you 
loss to the right. fund. Um, and you can't have the, you can't collect the employee portion if it fails. Correct. Well, it's so that up the self insurance point. will be bonded amount basically, and we still have to set the bonding amount. But for instance, Massachusetts, it's the bond amount is for the pre. No, sorry, Massachusetts is more complicated. Connecticut. In Connecticut, it's the amount of premiums you would pay in for that exemption period. Um, so the bond would be for, you know, if you're $16 million a year that you would have been paying, it's a bond for 16 times three for that exemption. So that if your plan fails, so you're paying back that loss to the trust fund that your plan has failed, you owe the amount that you you failed to provide benefits that you said you were going to with the plan. Um, that's, that's the bond amount. That's set in Connecticut, which is probably the most simple one that we found. It's just a straight premiums, the one percent. So the only piece that bugs me about your comment, which was very good, by the way, your, your analysis, was that if I'm, if I'm already paying that benefit today and I have to pay this premium, that is a double win that I never get back. There might be some people that are offering some auto benefit today. The other worry is that with the fully insured plan, you're not actually paying the premium until the plan starts. And that's a very important distinction. So there might be people, with, if you do a declaration, that can choose to opt out for that 16 months and then they're starting coverage May 1st, 2026. And they might be offering nothing right now. That's, yeah. yeah. No, so I get not that. I get not that only part. do you not have a double women, you have some people that are paying zero. Yeah, no, I get that part. I get that part. Is, are there other states that have done what uh, is being proposed here on the- There are states that are newer. I alluded last time we, we spoke to other state administrators. Every state administrator has struggled with this problem since the beginning of these laws. Um, I will say that there are two states that don't even have private plan exemptions and they love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, like we, we're Maine, like we've broken the statute what we have and it's important yeah. to follow that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of other states evolved from things that existed before. So like Rhode Island was short-term disability, California was short-term disability that evolved with the PFML. So they didn't really have this problem. New York is a totally different model. I know New York's reference, that's a, that's a private plan um, mandate. So everyone has to buy a private plan and there's an insurer of last resort. It's kind of like a workers' yeah. comp. Um, three states have done the declaration. Their feedback is they did not enjoy it at all. They said, felt it was unfair that, you know, some people that declared out came back to their state plan, you know, a couple of years later and avoided that first year. Uh, it's also administratively burdened, as you can imagine, to, to pull off um, Colorado try something different where, you know, if it was reimbursed and everyone on all sides that do not do that, you know, the ACLI says don't do that, the employers say don't do that, Colorado says don't do that, do not reimburse um, after the fact, because then you're giving money back to companies and employees have dispersed and you gotta chase them down that you can pay them back. Right, right. Um, Delaware is doing something slightly different, but um, they're allowing people to opt out early if they offer the benefit early, but they also benefited from being able to adopt rules far, far earlier than their contributions start, you know, we, we have both deadlines on the same day. Um, so we can't do their system because we, we don't have the time to adopt rules and then allow people to apply. We need to, we need to figure out what we're doing. And how long will it take? And maybe this is a question for Bureau of Insurance. How long will it take for re the review, you know, um, to see what it is? So, so we think that once the rules are adopted, it won't take very long. I mean, it'll take some time to finalize the checklist. Um, clearly, we have some guidance now that we can um, develop a checklist, uh, probably 30, 60 days. So it won't uh, take that long. Um, so, you know, we stand ready to help when we're ready. Um, but I will, you know, agree with Luke's point that um, there are no uh, plans right now that that meet the PFML standard. So, you know, anyone who's saying that uh, we have an existing plan of some sort, it, it just doesn't meet that standard. So um, I, don't, I just thought of it like, um, I know there's the time issues involved and in, in these things don't, you know, happen overnight, um, but would there be an incentive to employers to offer this benefit early um like you know it's like now employees are getting this benefit that that many of them don't currently have if we can offer some sort of incentive to employers to offer it early that helps employees 
um, who, who are in that realm not have to wait until May 1st or whatever the date was, 2026, to be able to access benefits. So is there, I mean, I know we need to, to fund the fund, um, to, but I mean, I don't know, I'm wondering if there's some way to encourage employers to offer benefits early via this, maybe some sort of waiver of well, a private think, plan. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a proposal because I think we'd be more comfortable approving or denying actual plans and not like a declaration where I promise to. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, like I would want to see the actual plan because Maine also has the added complexity of substantial equivalence. We are also the only state that has that so far. Um, so it's a little bit, you know, grayer than other states that it's greater than or equal to that you can pretty easily know what you, the standard is. Um, I think we're going to have more test cases where people are going to be like, well, can I get away with this or can I offer that? Um, so I think there's some that are going to be a lot messier in the appeals of like, no, we've denied this or oh, we approve this. Um, so I think we'd be more comfortable actually looking at actual plans. Yeah, if we, if we put in a process to be able to do that, and then we can say like, you know, maybe you have to pay into the fund until your plan is approved, but then you, you can, you know, or until your, your plan is not approved, but maybe is um, live and active, um, you know, then these employees would be actually be able to access these benefits early. Um, you know, and employers might have that incentive to, to work harder on it early. But that's also under the assumption that all of the systems and softwares yes. and everything are, are, I mean, I hate to yeah. back up the ice cream truck any further, but uh, <laughs> Jan 1, 2025, is that reasonable to, you know, before I start paying, I want to know what the program is. Mm -hmm. Am I, as an employer, going to feel good about what the software is, what the, what, no. what I'm paying into? Or is it kind of like, yeah, trust us. Yeah. Oh, in terms of like, yeah. do I know what I'm opting out of yet? Yeah. Yeah. And and you don't know what the act, actuary is going to say about how much money that is needed in the fund before we start up. Correct. Yeah. Sure. Joe had a comment. Uh, I was just going to say that that um, would make sense from a, a policy perspective um, because there is a delay before the benefits mm -hmm. are required. And so, um, it, it addresses the issue of sort of a free ride, you know, during a period of time pre benefits mm -hmm. being uh, addressed, still doesn't address the issue of the solvency of the plan and, and all the pieces being in place, which of course is very important. Um, yeah, I guess that was another, I'm sorry. No, 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 I was going to ask if, if, um, I didn't make my way entirely through the actuarial study that I circulated to everyone. Yeah. I don't know if people did, but it, did anyone? That's what I want to know. Like, yeah. I started scrolling, and the scroll was like this. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm wondering is if is if is if Maine needs that tax base, you know, to seed the program, uh, or is it really dependent on who's going to stay in the fund? Because I hear what you're saying about it's very complex. Because it's yeah. it's what population is coming out of the fund and how is that going to affect us in theory like we expect an opt-out rate uh, looking at other states two to three percent of employers will actually opt out believe it or not two to three percent of employers but it represents employees wise 10 to 30 percent yeah. 10 is um 10 is washington 30 is massachusetts we might be higher than that with a substantial equivalent standard um so we're talking about you know 10 to 30 percent of total <laughs> revenue potentially, right. um, but it's usually higher wage earners that are uh, the opt-outs yeah. just because they're lower risk usually. So it's probably more than a 30% loss. But that being said, you're also paying 10 to 30% less in the benefits once the benefit goes live. Um, but then there's that cost that if they come back, then they, it's the benefits increase, but not necessarily that, that lead up here that you're missing out on. So it's a very complex kind of financial analysis. Go ahead. So from a timeline standpoint, the com comments period closes in July, right? Yep. What do you do then? We have to decide if we're making edits and sending back out again. And when you send it back out, you send it back out for public comment again? So it's an endless cycle. Well, I think we're ready for July 1st. I think we got one other cycle we're going to get July 1st. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. And I think there's also two two tiers of the rulemaking. There's the things that we need to broadcast by January 1st for premiums and probably private plans. 
And then there's the things that we have a whole year, another year and a half to hash out around eligibility and actual benefits. You know, we, we need to signal to employers what we're doing January 1st in terms of how you pay, what you pay, what wages is, how you count your employees, what are you doing for private plans. That all needs to be broadcast, you know, by January 1st at least or at latest. Um, and then there's some of the other stuff that we can take a little bit more time next year if we haven't figured out proration 100%. We have a whole another year and a half that we could open up rules. You know, once they're finalized, you can always open up rules or hash out reductions or whatever, proration, a new burden. But you never want to go back to the legislature unless you pass it. Well, I mean, there, we, there's certain things, like I agree, that's, that intermittent language is probably needs to be cleaned up. So, so we're out of time, but before we adjourn, um, I just want to propose that, so Joe reminded me that fraud was actually something that was brought up um, in the comments. So for next time, we'll definitely resume the conversation on private plans, it's not, and also fraud. If there are other topics, email me and Luke that you want those uh, listed ahead. And I'm going to um, suggest a, a June 21st deadline for a written input that you want circulated to members ahead of the June 25th meeting. We can do what we did before, um, but June 21st would be the deadline to get us those, that, that input. So with that, is there a motion to- Just a yes. quick question. This is probably super fast. This is only for residents of May. So locality, I'll give I'll give the quick answer, but it's it, it's gonna there's a longer answer. Locality of work is a whole thing. We're trying to benchmark to state unemployment. So locality work, it's main workers, but it's it's more complex than a resident of Maine. You might have somebody that lives in New Hampshire but works in Maine five days a week, right? They're they're those are main wages. Um, so we're benchmarking locality of work to state UI definition, which is a, it's complex, but at least we can point to it and say, this is what a main worker quote unquote is. Um, and so like, for instance, that person that lives in Portsmouth that lives works in Kittery five days a week, those are main wages. I mean, they're working for a main employer. Yeah, um, if I get paid by Maine, I'm paying main income tax. And right. so MRS and state UI are close, but not the same. So locality of work, and our big thing was like, we just got to pick a lane and go with it. So we're going state UI uh, for locality of work. So this is mean we're also not going to allow employers that have employees in other states to buy in. Correct. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Motion to adjourn. Michelle, second. Oh, well. Sam, all in favor? I guess we're better than that one. That's wild.